Greetings, everyone, and Equinox blessings to you. As I'm recording this, we're honoring the spring equinox here in the Northern Hemisphere. And for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the autumn equinox. But for all of us, it is a time of the balancing of the light and dark. And I think this theme of light and dark is very powerful right now as we're moving towards the full moon on March 25th, which is what I want to talk about today. And it is a penumbral eclipse. And then we move on April 8th into the new moon and total solar eclipse. So we're in a dance of light and dark across these coming weeks. And I think we're all feeling this accelerated time of change and the energies of both light and dark that are playing out on the planet right now. And I want to talk some about that, how we can deal with that, and how we can be honoring and aligning with the energies of the earth and sky that are guiding us to heal, to awaken, and to move into a higher consciousness and the new paradigms of the Aquarian age. But let me show you the chart of this full moon. There is so much to talk about in this full moon, and I'm going to touch on what I see as the really significant core themes, because there are actually layers of complexity with the astrology of this full moon. But as you can see, the full moon will occur with the moon at five degrees of Libra opposite the sun at five degrees of Aries. And the Sabian symbol, the meaning of the degree of this full moon is our power of visualization for better or for worse. I think this is such a intense time and we're feeling the different timelines, the different dimensions, the different frequencies that are playing out on the planet right now. And I think this full moon is guiding us to be clear about the choices that we're making and what we are visualizing, what we are energizing as we're moving through this very intense time. And as I've talked about in previous videos, this Libra Aries opposition, this polarization, this energy of the south node in Libra opposite the north node in Aries, I see as this ongoing theme this year of are we coming back into balance, Libra, to move in new directions, to heal and move into new ways of expressing ourselves, to prepare us to move into the Aquarian age. And it's highly significant that we continue to have Chiron conjunct to the North Node, supporting us in how to heal, how to be in this process of clearing what we need to clear from the past in order to move in these new directions. And Chiron is conjunct Mercury, guiding us in how we're healing in, how we think about things, how we express ourselves, and Mercury is conjunct Arizona. All of this combination is supporting us in moving into new ways of being and new creative ways of expressing ourselves, again, to be in harmony with Libra, this energy calling us into balance, calling us into right relationship with each other and all of life. I think it's highly significant that at the time of this full moon, Maki Maki is conjunct the moon and in a wide conjunction with the south node. And as you remember, Maki Maki is that Kuiper belt object that is associated with the creation deity of Easter Island, the Polynesian culture that resided on that island, honored Maki Maki as this god of fertility, this bird god that was supporting them in their manifesting what they needed and 
uh, the having the energy of the earth support them. So Maki Maki is very connected along with Haumea in how we honor the resources of the earth. Are we in right relationship with the energies of the earth and these natural resources? But I also think it's significant that Maurice Fernandez, the evolutionary astrologer, also talks about how Maki Maki can represent that challenge for us as humanity in how we are facing issues of sustainability on the planet. He describes how Easter Island was isolated in the Pacific and how part of what became the downfall of the Polynesian culture on the island was their overpopulation, overuse of the natural resources on the island, leading to, to a climate crisis and collapse for the culture. So he really sees Maki Maki as holding a warning for us in this time. How are we in relationship with the natural environment? And are we through overpopulation and exploitation of our environmental resources, putting ourselves at risk? Which is certainly a huge theme in our world right now. So again, with it being conjunct this full moon and this dance of light and dark, what are we visualizing? What are we energizing? What do we want to manifest? moving forward at, on the planet at this time of the full moon. It's also very significant that Pluto is playing a powerful role at the time of this full moon, trining the moon, sextiling the sun, calling us to be in this time of transformation as we're preparing for our more full movement into the Aquarian age which again, I see as at the end of 2024. But Pluto, in this strong aspect of both the sun and the moon, is calling us into that alchemical process of burning away what we need to release in order to be able to come into balance and be moving into these new forms and new paradigms. But what is the challenge that we have to face to be in this process of coming back into balance? It's particularly powerful that we now see this combination that I've referred to in earlier videos that's here in Capricorn is squaring the sun and the moon at the time of this full moon and also moving into squaring the lunar nodes. And these uh, centaurs and Kuiper belt objects and asteroids have in combination been moving into squaring the lunar nodes across the last few weeks and will continue to be squaring the lunar nodes. But it's particularly potent that they're now also squaring the sun and moon at the time of this penumbral eclipse calling our attention to these energies of light and dark. What are we visualizing? And are we visualizing a future that is dark, despair, and destruction, and the shadow side of our experience as humanity, which we are seeing playing out on the earth? Or can we visualize our collective consciousness and our experience as humanity awakening, healing, moving in new directions to be coming into harmony, to be fostering peace, justice, truth, right relationship with each other, right relationship with the earth, and moving towards a sustainable way of being in relationship with each other and in relationship with the natural resources. This is a huge turning point, crisis point, choice point for us as humanity. And let's unpack this powerful combination in a little bit more depth, 
because it's not only squaring the lunar nodes, the sun and moon, but it's in a grand trine, particularly here with Jupiter. And now Jupiter is moving into that conjunction with Uranus that will be exact on April 20th. But as I've said before, it's within a five degree orb from March 20th to May 20th. So we're already feeling that powerful combination of Jupiter and Uranus, which is such a powerful conjunction at this time. And I want to go into it more in depth in an upcoming video. But it is in such a powerful way, calling us into truth, into clarity, into ways that we are seeing more clearly how we are in relationship with each other and with the earth. But being a part of this grand trine, it's also trying to give us clarity and more awareness of how we are in relationship with the earth. This is an earth trine and the energies of the earth. And this combination in Capricorn in particular is calling our attention to this dance of light and dark in humanity and how we interact with the earth and how, again, are we visualizing and manifesting things on the planet for better or for worse. We have here Ixion, or I like the pronunciation Ixion because I think it fits the meaning of this Kuiper Belt object. We have Quawar, we have the Centaur Pholus, and we have the Asteroid Ceres. All of these together are integrating uh, an understanding of whether we're connecting with the earth and whether we are manifesting systems, Capricorn, on the planet that are in right harmony or are destructive. Remember that Quawar is that creation deity that is about singing creation into being and holding everything in right harmony. And Pholus is about how do we clear and heal our ancestral lineage and what's gotten out of balance? Remember, Pholus is that centaur that Melanie Reinhardt says the theme is the lid comes off. We are opening up what's been out of balance, this lineage of issues that need healing, that need clarity, that need to come into focus so that we can come back into balance. And then we have Ceres, the asteroid that relates to the Earth Mother and how we are connecting with the resources of the Earth. So three of the four of these are about being in a healing process, coming back into more harmony and balance. But then we have Ixion here. And let me tell more of the story of Ixion because I think this is very important in how it's in this tight square with the moon and sun and in this combination with these other planetary bodies. Remember the story of Ixion is that he was the king of Lapthus. And it's not clear in the mythology whether he was the son or grandson of Ares, but we get that sense that he is related to the god Ares, which is affiliated with the energy of Mars. And remember, Mars is the planetary ruler of Ares. The story of Ixion is that he marries and has promised his father-in-law the bridal gift for the marriage, but the marriage happens and he decides he doesn't want to pay the bride price. The father-in-law, feeling insulted and humiliated, steals some of his horses as compensation for what he should have been gifted with this bride price. Then Ixion, angry that the father-in-law has taken some of his possessions, 
sets up a banquet and invites his father-in-law and then betrays him, pushes him into a fire and murders him. Ixion is then rejected by the other princes and royalty and people in positions of leader for doing such a heinous act. And he goes mad because things have spun out of control for him. Finally, Zeus takes pity on him and invites him to Olympus. But Ixion, not able to actually ever come into remorse or take responsibility for his actions, again acts in an impulsive way out of his own arrogance, hubris, grandiosity, feels lust for Zeus's wife, Hera, and pursues her. Zeus realizes what's going on and ends up ultimately punishing Ixion, blasting him with a thunderbolt, and, and orders him to be tied to this fiery wheel that will spin him for all eternity. So it's an incredible story about this person in a position of power who gets so caught up in his pride and his arrogance and his impulsivity and his desire for control to do things the way he wants to do them, his willingness to break the rules, to break any social etiquette, to disregard others' feelings or concerns, to disregard the consequences of his, of his actions, to get what he wants that ultimately leads to his own punishment and demise. I want to talk a little bit about this because to me, this story is such a powerful story of the destructiveness of grandiose narcissism. And I want to talk about narcissism at the individual level and at the collective level. And I speak about this coming from my background as a clinical psychologist. And after I earned my PhD, I was so concerned by these issues that I saw around narcissism that I ended up doing four years of postgraduate training um, at a psychoanalytic institute to try to understand more fully both narcissistic and borderline personality disorders and what is at the root of those issues and how can they be addressed? How can they be healed? And part of what I learned is that, you know, from the cultural perspective, when we see a grandiose narcissist and we see a lot of these kinds of personalities and people can be on a spectrum with that, from pathological grandiose narcissism to more milder aspects of that. But you often see some of those dynamics in people in positions of leadership when you see them operating from a place of arrogance, hubris, grandiosity, and the need for control, the need for power. And one of the classic aspects of narcissism is a lack of empathy for others. It's a lack of true care and concern for others and how your actions or your, if you're in a position of leadership, the decisions that you're making may impact them. It all becomes about how is this affecting me? How is this furthering me? How is this supporting me in my own experience of power and control and pride? We often think that people that are exemplifying grandiose narcissism are strong, are powerful. The reality is, when I really did this deeper dive in understanding narcissism, 
is that the origins of narcissism come from early experiences of not feeling tr truly seen and supported in the true sense of self. So the child may grow up with a narcissistic parent, feeling like they need to be an extension of that parent, please the parent, meet that parent's expectations, or feel like somehow they're not meeting those expectations. They're never good enough. But the core issue is that the child doesn't develop a secure, strong sense of self. There's actually an inner experience of emptiness and or an inner experience of insecurity, of vulnerability, feelings of inadequacy. So the narcissistic person covers up that underlying sense of emptiness or inadequacy by this really bold, strong, grandiose persona. And they get caught up in needing to achieve, needing external validation to shore up a sense of self because they can't hold on to a strong sense of self internally. So the narcissist is very vulnerable to how other people are responding to them. And when they feel hurt or they don't feel supported or affirmed, the classic ways that a narcissist will defend themselves is by distancing or devaluation, either cutting the person that's offended them out of their life or distancing from them or lashing out at them, devaluing them, insulting them. Again, in an effort to shore up this sense of self that is so fragile, that beneath the surface, there is such a deep sense of insecurity and inadequacy. But it plays out in an outer sense in this grandiosity this need for control, the need to fulfill my desires, like you see in Ixion, this lack of empathy, disregard for the rules and laws and ways of social interaction that everyone else is supposed to live by, because it's all about how do I get what I need to shore up my sense of self to feel in control to feel powerful, to feel like I've got this affirmation and adoration and admiration from others in order to feel okay. It is very dangerous when you see this in people in positions of power, in positions of leadership. And again, I'm sure we can all identify a number of leaders in the world right now that reflect these characteristics. And again, part of the danger of that in positions of leadership is there is no true concern for the welfare of others. It's all about how I elevate myself and maintain my sense of power and control. What we see with Ixion is how destructive that can become in relationships with others and the way then it created external chaos, that Ixion created chaos in his family relationships, in his community, and ultimately it comes back in this way in which the narcissist at some point is needing to see and take responsibility for the consequences of these choices that have been so harmful, exploitative of others, destructive of others. And I do believe, again, with Jupiter moving into conjunction with Uranus, the truth will cut through the illusion individually and collectively to help us see the truth of who we are in order to support us in healing and taking responsibility for our issues individually 
and collectively. I'm bringing this up because this is such a powerful theme in this upcoming full moon lunar eclipse. And I think it's a powerful theme, not only in how we see this play out in individuals and how they're trying to manage their wounds of not having a secure sense of self. What I realized in my practice and in the training that I got was that the way to heal that narcissistic pattern is to be willing to see the way in which you have built this cover, this false sense to protect against that underlying insecurity, inadequacy, feeling of emptiness. When you can begin to develop that witness self that can realize I'm not actually being my true self. I actually am terrified to be seen because I feel empty inside. I feel insecure. When the person can realize that that grandiosity is a protection, is a false self, is a cover, then they can begin to move into taking responsibility for their choices and begin to open to doing the inner healing that needs to happen to come into wholeness and align with the true self. It means facing the feelings of vulnerability. It means facing the insecurity and in an inadequacy and feelings of emptiness and beginning with support to begin to hold compassion for the sense of self to realize the roots of this imbalance and to begin to develop a true sense of self, to come into that sense of security and ability then to be authentic, to be able to hold compassion and care for the self and therefore be able to be more in true relationship with others, holding more empathy for others. But it's very hard for a narcissist to, to do that deeper work because it means facing that fear of inadequacy, of the collapse of the sense of self. If I really go inside, I feel like there's nothing there or it's an inadequate, bad, uh, insecure self that I'll face. So part of why I'm exploring this is that not only is this a significant issue psychologically in modern Western cultures in particular, but I also believe it's a pattern that we're facing in our collective consciousness. I want to put out soon a video that I've done on the processional cycle, but I've talked in past videos about how, as we're preparing to move into the age of Aquarius, we need to heal the unresolved issues, particularly from the age of Aries and the age of Pisces. And I do believe these eclipses, the lunar eclipse and then the solar eclipse, are really activating our awareness of these issues that need to be resolved, that need to be healed. I think we're on an accelerated trajectory across the rest of the year to really face those issues in order to be prepared for the activation of the age of Aquarius and the movement into higher consciousness and into new paradigms. What's been so out of balance from the age of Aries when we were called as humanity to explore more fully our sense of self our experience of separation from each other and from the cosmos to explore who we are and kind of and move into more understanding of our own hero's journey. Because there were so many ways in which that process in the era, age of Aries got out of balance, there is a theme in the collective consciousness of narcissism. And I think we see this in modern Western cultures in our 
overemphasis on materialism, consumerism, competition, the need to be the best, to achieve, to have power and control. Because again, it's this longing to, if I achieve, if I get external affirmation, I'm okay. I'm better than others. I'm somehow on top of things. I'm in control. I'm okay. But it leads to this destructive pattern in our collective consciousness of more and more need for control, for power over, for conquest, for consuming resources in order to fill that inner emptiness. And we are on a path of humanity that is phenomenally destructive to the earth and to each other because we're not facing that fear, that fear of our own insecurity, inadequacy, vulnerability, fear of death, fear of not being in control. We are destroying others and the resources around us in that defensive survival effort to feel okay. And I think we see this in the incredibly tragic wars that are playing out on the planet right now. They're coming out of fear and or out of a need for a sense of security and a sense of superiority in order to feel safe or to feel better or to feel in control or to feel that 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 nationalism of that country is secured and protected and elevated. This issue of narcissism needs to be faced and healed. And I think this full moon and lunar eclipse is saying, face that shadow aspect of yourself. Face that shadow aspect of humanity and be aware of what you're visualizing, what you're focused on, for better or for worse. Because if we are caught in that survival pattern, individually or collectively, we are on a path of destruction, just like the story of Ixion tells us. If we face that underlying insecurity, if we face our fears, if we face those feelings of inadequacy or that experience of emptiness, then we can heal and we can come back into balance and be on a path to develop a more secure sense of self and deeper, more authentic relationships with the others and be in right harmony and right balance within ourselves, with each other, with the earth. But we need to look at those shadow aspects of ourselves and allow ourselves to heal. In the trauma-informed life coach program that I'm co-teaching with Christina Lee, we've been talking about this theme of narcissism and how there's another strand of narcissism that can play out individually and culturally. And that is what James Masterson, who is one of the people that I studied with, he would describe it as closet narcissism. And interestingly enough, you see grandiose narcissism more in males. You see closet narcissism more frequently in females. And closet narcissism is, again, coming from this wound of growing up, not feeling truly seen, having some early trauma such that we don't feel affirmed or supported to be in our true selves. So we develop a pattern of people pleasing or caretaking, using our, our abilities and our gifts to somehow get that affirmation from others or feel like I am enough, I am good enough, I can be seen and valued because look at what I can give to others. Look at how I can be the consummate caretaker. But it comes at the expense of being true and authentic in myself. 
And this is some of the issue I've had to deal with with my own issues growing up. It, it can make you really ripe for becoming a therapist because, you know, there's then if I can if I can take care of others, if I can truly hear them and see them, maybe someone will see me and maybe I can feel okay. And I had to do my own deep work to come into my true self and come into that more authentic way of being and more mutual way of being in relationship. It's a journey of healing. It's a journey of being willing to face ourselves in order to come into alignment with the true self. And I truly believe that as we're moving towards this age of Aquarius, we each need to heal what needs to be healed in our sense of self. And it may be for some that, uh, you know, way of coping that is that grandiose false self to cover over the insecurity within, or it may be the closet narcissism of if I can please others, care for others, be there for others, I'm okay. I feel like I've got value. I'm okay. So this powerful full moon and lunar eclipse saying, wake up, look at those shadow aspects in yourself. Look at those shadow aspects in the culture. And it's time Chiron conjunct the North Node to heal, to come back into balance. And let me quickly just also show you where these energies are in the sky at the time of this full moon. So at the time of this full moon lunar eclipse, the sun will actually be in the stars of Pisces. And Mercury will also be there, Neptune this is a really interesting configuration where so many of the planets are in the part of the sky called the waters, particularly these planets in Aquarius and in Pisces. So I truly believe that we're being supported to dissolve what needs to dissolve and to be opening to the compassion of Pisces with ourselves, with others, so that we can heal. The sun is in an out-of-sign conjunction with Neptune, supporting us in seeing what we need to see in ourselves, to see those shadow aspects of ourselves individually and collectively, but to hold it in compassion so that it isn't about self-recrimination, but is about taking responsibility for ourselves and making those choices and taking those steps to heal. The full moon will actually be in the sky, in the stars of Virgo. Virgo is the harvest goddess, the winged woman who's holding the sheaf of wheat. And I believe that it's significant that Virgo, that is so much about the harvest goddess, our connection with the earth, the nurturance of the earth that feeds us and, got, and grounds us and nurtures us, that she has wings. And I think it's significant that it's showing us that integration of spirituality and embodiment that as we come into balance and as we work these issues to heal within our sense of self, then we can connect to our soul self, that spiritual part of ourselves, but truly honor our embodiment and our deep connection with the beauty and the gifts of Mother Earth. So again, I think the powerful themes of this full moon are Face the light and the dark. Be in your wholeness. Be conscious of what you're visualizing, what you're energizing, what you're manifesting. Be aware of what may be in your unconscious and acting out in these ways that are out of balance 
in order to deal with those underlying wounds or that lack of a secure sense of self that needs to be seen in order to heal. That this is the theme squaring the lunar nodes. This is the karmic choice point, the ancestral lineage, the issues left over from the age of Aries that we need to face and heal to come back into balance in order to move in new directions, in order to come into a new healed whole sense of self, in order to move into new forms that can be in balance, be just and fair and true, that are reflecting the paradigms of the Aquarian age, how we can be in collaborative community with each other, in empathy and compassion for each other, honoring our mutual relationships with each other, and honoring the sacredness of the earth and the natural resources around us. So as we move towards this full moon lunar eclipse, I encourage you to meditate, take time to tune into what you're visualizing. And so many of us make goals and set affirmations or intentions for ourselves, but we need to also face what are we activating unconsciously? What's unresolved, unhealed in us that may actually be affecting what we're emanating and what we're manifesting? So I think there's a powerful energy in this full moon eclipse that's supporting us and seeing what's been in the shadows and bringing it into the light of consciousness so that we can heal, so that we can hold that compassion for ourselves, take responsibility for those wounds from the past, for the ancestral wounds that we may carry, so that we can move into that compassion for ourselves to support us in moving into our true authentic selves so that then what we're emanating and how we interact with others is true empathy, mutuality, compassion. So that how we are interacting with the earth is coming from a place of gratitude and a place of honoring the sacredness of all of life. As we can do that inner work, we support the healing of the planet. We then emanate love and compassion to those who are suffering, who are in trauma on the planet right now. We can then emanate that healing energy to support those who are out of balance and caught in that narcissistic dynamic individually or collectively to, to have that ability to face the truth of who they are and open to healing. But whether individuals are able to make that choice to heal or not, the more we are operating from that place of higher consciousness, coming from the heart with compassion, the more we seed that in the collective and support the collective consciousness shifting out of a culture of narcissism and destruction and imbalance into a collective consciousness of healing and compassion and collaboration and true community. May we activate that, visualize that, and support that together. Blessings and love to all of you. Blessed be.